the company, it, I really started kind of as a sister company to my sister's company, Noni, of Noni Patterns, Noni Bags. And I started out doing this because she asked me to make some interesting bag hardware for the knitted felted bag patterns that she was doing. And at that time I was living, <clears throat> well, I was in, I was still in academia because I'd done my PhD in cultural anthropology in Bali, Indonesia. So I lived there for a few years. I had um, lots of contacts, friends, connections, and Bali is full of amazing artisans who make jewelry and um, textiles. Here's an example of gorgeous supplementary web textiles. And she asked me, could you get some really cool hardware made for the bags? And I said, sure, of course I can do that. So I mobilized all of my connections and uh, one of my dearest friends in, in Bali brought to me, the man who has now been my collaborator for over 10 years, brought to me a booth and he made a series of drawings and one of them. Oh, I accidentally muted you. Could you unmute yourself? I'm sorry. Oh, where did I do that? There, I unmuted myself. I'm so sorry. That was. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. We're still all kind of, you know, figuring this Zoom thing out. So I got this filigree ring made, which is still in the catalog. Although I need to reorder it. And originally, and this one is uh, sterling silver handmade. So this is one of the original sterling silver ones that were handmade there. And um, that was the first, so the, the idea was that the, there would be a tab that would attach to the bag and then the handle would attach here, but I've repurposed this and now it's, you know, it's a, it's a shawl cup with this kind of snap on strap. So that was one of the, the first items. And then another one that I made was this. It's rosewood, it has a silver lining in here, that's sterling silver. And these are little tiny moonstones set in silver bezels. I don't know if you can see those very well because sometimes they'll flash blue. And so those were some of my first um, pins. And my, I went to a wholesale show with my sister with all of this beautiful handmade in Bali covered with stones and sterling silver, whatever bag jewelry and those shop owners kept saying, wow, that's so beautiful. I wish this were a shawl pin. Meanwhile, I had come out with a line of knitting needles, which were amazing, but they, my artisans didn't kiln dry the wood. So when they got to me, they, especially the small sizes, they kind of curved, they curved themselves. So they were unsaleable as knitting needles. They functioned beautifully, but they, people want them to be straight when they buy them. So I was thinking about all of those twisted knitting needles and the request for shawl pins. And I said, for you, a shawl pin. And I went home and this is one of the original ones. I went home and I cut them off and I used a pencil sharpener to sharpen the ends. And then I like sanded them and polished them with a polishing <laughs> cloth so that I could make shawl pins. And that's how I ended up doing what I'm doing. That's how I ended up making accessories for closing shawls and other knitwear. Is that like, okay, let me rescue all those knitting needles <laughs> that are all twisted and wonky and, you know, repurpose these, these um, beautiful pieces of bag jewelry because that's what, you know, that I was listening. F folks were saying, oh, we want that to be a shawl pin. So I pivoted and made shawl pins. That's how... That's how I got into this realm of closures and styling solutions for shawls, cowls, um, garments. That's how that started. And now, 10 years old, my collaborator Agus has gotten married. He has a child. His wife is now part of the company and she oversees um, 
quality control. She's the one who wraps everything up and sends it to me and, and a goose manages the product development. So when I say, oh, I want us to do a tree frog, I send him pictures of tree frogs and he makes the filigree design. And then he takes it to his wax, our wax worker who makes the representation in wax and then it gets cast. And they're all, every single one of them is a lost wax casting. So each piece of metal bag jewelry or clasps, whatever, all of the metal items that I have are um, the ornamental pieces are made in Indonesia. And each one will have had about oh, 20 oh, sets of hands on it before it gets to you. 20 sets of hands. A lot of families that each one of these things supports. A lot of families. And when I, I write fair trade on the packaging, and what I mean by fair trade is it's more than just I buy it directly from the producers. That's what a lot of people mean by fair trade. What I mean by fair trade is when we ask when we are determining our cost, we ask our artisans how much to make this, to produce this design. And the artisans tell us what the price is. We don't tell them what we're gonna pay. We pay what they say they wanna be paid because their calculus is gonna be based on what their family needs over the course of a month to, to cover their bills and to, to put on their ceremonial things. There are a lot of ceremonies and they're very expensive to do in Bali. So we never bargain. We never try to get people to charge us less, never. We always pay what the artisans tell us they need to make on the design. You know, we tell them we wanna make however, this is our anticipated volume and then they give us a price. And now it's um, since COVID, we are keeping our casting houses alive, our orders. And every time we take an order to our casting house, the owner comes out and says, oh, thank you so much for bringing this order. Business is so down. We're so grateful that you're still bringing us business and we're so amazed. So that is, you are supporting a lot of folks when you buy a piece of jewel. Um, one of the pieces that's made in Indonesia. And then the other pieces, the leather pieces, the, the screw enclosures and the, and the pedestal buttons, those are made here in the United States. And these um, components that are these very specific shapes, very, very clean shapes, these require a big piece of equipment called a clicker. And it's a huge table, like thing that comes down, like there's a table here and then there's a big thing and then you pull it down and it presses onto a, like a basically like a big cookie cutter for leather, presses on that and it clicks out the shape. It's a massive expensive piece of equipment. I don't have one. And um, this company in Ohio does that for me. And then the ones that have these tabs, so the cuffs, the tab closures, you know, this leather strap, those I make. The, you, don't, you can't see my table, but the table right here is where I make these um, pieces from strap stock that I have cut into, this, into strips. So I hand punch and hand shape the edges and set the rivets and set the snaps to make your cups and your closures for you. So that's, that's that. Are there any questions, specific questions about the process that you'd like me to answer? So, oh, Christina. Oh yeah, she says she loves the mod loop that she just showed. Yay. I, I like um, the chunky winter knits too. Yeah, they're, they've got that scale. They don't disappear from the mm -hmm. big warm pieces, yeah. Just a simple brioche scarf done in the chunky yarn and it just really, it really kind of livens up the whole look. It's, they're wonderful. And sometimes even like 
not just one, but like a couple of them, like a bigger, chunkier. I just think it's very on trend and they look amazing. Yeah, I, I, I have an affection for the bigger scale pieces myself. You can see I'm wearing this big uh, Marrakesh clasp. Um, I don't know. I, I'm interested to hear from your, uh, from the rest of our participants here in the room. What about, how do you feel about the big scale pieces? Because I've been getting the sense that like smaller scale is better, but maybe it's going the other way now again, because it's been kind of smaller, lighter for a while. What do you think? Any opinions about that? Well, many, uh, um, and feel free to unmute yourself if you want to, 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 to share. You, a lot of us are in, are in Texas, so we don't get, most of the time it's very hot here, so we don't have a lot of big chunky knits. I so you're wearing shawls in the air conditioning, right? Right, yeah. yeah, yeah. But I personally like the big chunky stuff with the, like, like this, I don't know if you can see it, but. Um, yeah, I can. That looks yeah. like the latch, is that the latch? Yeah, I like that. I like the way that that looks. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I have, a, I, I, I love making the metal pieces. I love making the metal pieces. Um, you know, the ornamental things. I love make, I love designing them. But for the most part, what I want to wear myself with, with knitwear are pedestal buttons. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'll just go, I'll just go through now that I've told you where the different chunks of you know materials are coming from, I can tell you what. My, my, I have, um, I would say four basic groups of products. So sort of four broad categories of products. The first are the screw enclosures where I have a, a smooth threaded cylinder that goes in between stitches. So the pedestal buttons are the most basic of that concept. So it's two leather discs. And these are some of those ones that I told you are clicked. And they're edge painted, the edges are painted. And then each one, let's see if I can show you better. I want you to be able to see it. I'm hoping you can see that is a stamp that says jewel. So oh. each one is stamped with jewel. So that you know if you're encountering a ripoff, because it's not going to have a jewel. <laughs> <laughs> so um, <clears throat> the screw component goes in one side from the front. It's worked in between the stitches. So there's the back. And then you put the backing on and then you screw it in. So you're creating, if you've got two layers of, of material, you're marrying them together so that they're going to stay connected. And by screwing them in, you're securing them in um you're securing them securely <laughs> you're attaching them securely um so i'll give you an example of what that can look like and i i originally did the pedestal buttons thinking oh this is a way to do a button a conventional button that can be very easily removed for laundering the piece but once i so that's why it's called a pedestal button instead of something something else but once I made them, I realized that we, I didn't have to think about them as buttons at all because they could go anywhere. They could move anywhere in the garment. They didn't have to just be, you know, the center closure. And so basically I could throw out my ideas about closures and buttons and how they're supposed to work and just kind of start over with like, oh, all right, let's just say, you know, all bets are off. We can do whatever we want. What, what are those possibilities? What do those possibilities look like? So. This was one early exploration of mine. And it's a scarf. You can see from that gap, you can see it's a scarf. <clears throat> and what I've done is connected the edges of that scarf wrapped around the body multiple Ooh. times. I've connected them with the pedestal buttons. And so the, connect, the, the pedestal button connection is doing work. It's keeping it together. But it's also become a design element. Those little round circles with that little bit of sparkle of the screw 
becomes an element of the, the design because I've got these kind of these horizontals and, and um, rectangular shapes. And then I've got these round shapes that, in, that um, intersect and then do this work of creating this collar. And I think this collar is amazing. I love it, love it. And it feels terrific. So go home and look at all those scarves that you stopped wearing because people don't wear scarves anymore. Go look at your scarves and like find the one that you, that you, you the fiber is great and you know it's really good, it's really cool looking but you don't wear it anymore and then you do this you can do this this takes eight that is the button and so you can see that I'm way beyond buttons here way beyond buttons and that this was kind of my first like I was saying my first like I'm gonna break out of the button box I'm just gonna. <laughs> go for something really more exciting and interesting. So this is this is where I started. And then um, I got shawl pins from these ladies, but I wanted I want to just give you a, a few more ideas because I, I really view the, the pedestal buttons are like nails or screws. They're like these foundational tools that you can use to create stylings that are exciting. And um, I like flat stylings. And I like flat stylings because you can see all the knitting. So imagine, imagine this were brioche to be able to see all of it. Because instead of bunching it around my neck like this little silk thing that I have on, if uh, normally I think a lot of us wear shawls and very bunched, um, bunched stylings, but you can't see the knitting as well in that kind of styling as you can if it's flat. And here too, like the scarf, I've just taken my two edges of the knitwear and lined them up and put pedestal buttons at the connection. And then that allows me to have a really interesting shape. And I can move that shape around so that I've got kind of a drape coming down one side. Suddenly I'm in I'm sculpting with the knitwear by using the pedestal buttons. And that is exciting to me. And not just because you can see the knitwear and because some of that volume comes away from the neck and can be more controlled where it goes, but also the, the shawl design right now, contemporary shawl design is amazing. Uh, the color work, the stitch patterns, I've even seen recently some pieces that are starting to have more of a, um, they're kind of similar to this. They kind of zig and zag. You know, I've seen some pieces recently that kind of change directions, kind of like this with the short rows doing something interesting. So you can have a very different thing going on with color on one side of the shawl versus the other. And if you're, Choreographing your knitwear with pedestal buttons in conjunction with shawl pins and other closures, then you can start to manage where your knitwear is overlapping so that you're controlling the way those lines of design are interacting. And that allows you to extend and amplify the design work of the, of the original designer and to add your own creative elements that come from, that are all about your aesthetic to add that in and do it intentionally and differently every single time you put your knitwear on. So you cast off and you're not done. You get to do a creative styling choreographing process every time you put your shawl on potentially. You may find that you that and I I do find after I've experimented with a piece for a while that I'll kind of get a sweet spot. I'll think, okay, uh, this is where I, I'll reach a point where I'm like, oh, this is it. This is my favorite way to, to wear it. And so you may settle on something, but I strongly encourage you to, to experiment and play. And <clears throat> I'll give you a little, I'll give you a little, taste of what that can look like. So this is kind of, this is an asymmetrical triangle. It's 
pointy on one end, it's blunt on the other end because I ran out of yarn. And I'm happy that I did because having one blunt end turns out to be very interesting. So here's what I'm going to propose to you all who are here. Start at one end so that you've got one short end and the rest of your knitwear is here. Start like that. And then start overlapping, really paying attention. OK, if I overlap it like this, just assume you have pedestal buttons. And so you say, OK, if I overlap it like this, I can hold it like this. I can wear it like this all day long if I put a pedestal button here. So what I'm what I'm gonna notice here is everywhere where the where the styling will fail, I'm gonna put a pedestal button. So I've got one there, and I'm gonna put one here. And I'm just I'm holding these on with uh, washers in the back, just because I'm I'm still playing. I'm not committed. I'm not screwing them in yet. So now I can have that styling if I want. And then, you know, the volume of my knitwear is hanging dramatically down the front. And I can't achieve this any other way unless I want to like sew it in place or use safety pins or something, but this is much more stylish than safety pins. So I can wear it like that. I could, what happens if I turn it a quarter turn? I like turning things a quarter turn. Now that's totally different. I'm getting a totally different kind of feel. It almost feels cape-like. That's kind of cool. I could turn it the other way, but what I'm gonna do instead of exhausting this, I'm gonna just keep moving down the network like I was telling you, just to move down the network. And I think if you try this, you're gonna re you're gonna discover that your knitwear is way more exciting than than even you thought. <clears throat> so I can create a little bit of a shape like that. I start to get that piece folded down. I could do it with this side. So do you see, you see how this is starting to be kind of, the knitwear is looking a little different each time I move down. So this way I've got my blunt end on top. I do my pointy end on top. Maybe keep it more symmetrical, but like I was saying, just keep moving, keep moving, see what happens. See, now that's interesting. I can make this point line up perfectly along that line <clears throat> if I want. That's interesting. And then I'd have to put a pedestal button here, one there, maybe one here, and one there to keep that overlap, that overlap doing exactly what I want. So say I get to the end. Then I'm going to turn it upside down. So my point of the triangle is up. And I'm going to start over. So now I have a shawl collar because I folded down my point. And let's imagine I want this kind of draped look. That's kind of pretty. So for this, I want to control where this part is because I don't want it to do that. That's annoying. That's called knitwear misbehavior. I don't like knitwear misbehavior. So I want to control this and keep it right there. So I can put a pedestal button here, but I can hide it. So this is draped over it. And then I'm going to put a pedestal button here and I'm going to hide that. I'm not going to do it right now, but I could do that. And then this sculptural sort of draped styling will actually stay in place. So often on, on knitwear pattern photography, Maybe it would look kind of like this, but there would be no closures there. So you know that as soon as you 
turned around and reached for something that would happen, right? But with the pedestal button in place, you can actually keep all of it secured. Now, let's imagine, let's just, for the sake of experimentation, put this one in place. And then I'm gonna try a shawl pin over here so that I've got my pedestal button doing the work of nailing this styling in place, but then I wanna do an, I wanna do something ornamental with a with a shawl pin. So then my so my shawl pin is holding that side in place. It's totally secure. And I'm gonna manage this positioning with a shawl pin. And because this is one of my favorites, I'm gonna use the Runa manular brooch, which always goes in horizontal and then you bring the ring down over the stick and then set it in place. So maybe that's what the, way, the direction I'm gonna go in. So I've got this really minimalist shape and I'm going to add a little bit of a, this one's quite, it's quite ornamental. And I've got it in a, a white metal and then in a blackened metal. So maybe I would want to try that. Or maybe I want to stay with my minimalist kind of ambiance vibe and do uh, one of these shapes. And because I've got, I'm creating lots of triangles in the way that I'm styling this, this mid-century modern triangle could be a good way to keep that so there so then I'm using the pedestal button on one side like I said to keep that part in to keep that controlled and then using the shawl pin I think I want to position this up higher actually I want to put it right on that over that collar shape that I've created. There, that, I like that. One of the things that I learned in my childhood, my uncle um, is a, a great lover of the arts and he was in music education and he would take me and my sister to museums on when we would go to visit my uncle on holiday. And we would look at paintings or lady, ladies' dresses or architecture or sculpture, it didn't even matter what. He always asked the same question, where does your eye go? Well, we were little, we were, we were little and, and you know, looking up at everything. And we, and we would stand in front of the whatever it was, the ladies' dresses or the architecture or the, you know, the painting or the sculpture, and we would have to figure it out. Okay, where does my eye go? So just, you know, you kind of observe in yourself where your eye's going, and then we, and he'd say, okay, where did your eye go? And we would say, well, I think it went here first, and then there, and, and then, and he would say, well, why? Why did your eye go there first? Why do you think it went there first? Why do you think it went there second? So then we have to think about that. Well, that red shape is brighter than the dark background. And then there's that yellow line that goes up there. And then there's the squiggle. And so we'd have to understand the composition. He was teaching us composition. And it got applied to everything. So that when we would go around, like he would take us to New York. They lived in Pennsylvania. Take us to New York City. And we would be outside of a building that had round windows and, and then in the front of the sidewalk, big round shapes. And, and so by the, by the time we were like teenagers, he'd say, well, why do you think there's the concrete has been poured in that big round shape? And be like, because oh, it's referencing the windows, duh. You know, <laughs> at that time, we had, we had gotten the concept so well that it was quite obvious why, why. So the reason I'm telling you this is my uncle, his influence has carried into my way of thinking about knitwear. 
and thinking about knitwear on the body. So when I'm looking at the way that knitwear is, is styled, I want to think about that diagonal line relating to this triangle, related to these draping shapes, related to this triangle and the stick. And I want to I want to make all those observations and I want to ask myself the question, okay, where does my eye go? So where do I think of your eye is going to go looking at me? And I'm going to say, okay, I think the eye is going to go down like that, but then I think the eye is going to follow up here. And then I think it's going to, you know, follow this drape. And then I think it's going to get to my face and then make that circuit again. And this, if you're intentionally styling your knitwear to extend amplify, augment, punch up the, the design work that the designer's already done. And you know that you want someone to see you in a particular way. This gives you the power to control all of that. If you are seeing your knitwear as an opportunity to create a draped form on your body that feels great, will stay in place, and will make you feel beautiful and look beautiful. Wow, that's so great. I love that. That's why I do what I do because I wanna, I wanna help you do that with your knitwear. So I wanted to see what's in the chat here. I think, okay, Christina, I think you were referencing the, the runa here. I have to say, Rune, the Runa is one of my favorite pins, and I'll tell you why. Because it's got this really open work, it wants to integrate with whatever it's on top of. A lot of my pieces have open work, but it, they're not, it's not so obvious. So for example, I think you can see, because you can see the background through it, you can see that the, the, the sea turtle like all my critters, is a very open form. And we do that partly because it creates, it creates a fairly large object, but it's light. But it's not obvious that, that there are those holes because the, the filigree is, is predominating. But this piece, because it's flat rather than dimensional, the holes, the open work is the, is the show, is the story. And so when you see it on a piece, whatever it's on, it's going to show that color. And then it, it integrates in that way. But the sort of the personality of the piece changes depending on what the color is behind it. Is it going to stand out? Is it going to kind of blend in? So you can see that it ends up, it ends up kind of giving off a different vibe depending on what you have it on. So, we're, so any questions? Any requests? Any conundrums? Any challenges? I'm your resource right now. <laughs> this is Charlotte. Um, do you make the pedestal buttons in the filigree or are they all leather? We have, um, we have one style, and actually this is like one of the few things that I didn't design, but we're, we're actually working on some new things that will um, be metal pedestal button-like components. They're gonna have a different mechanism, but I have these They're in pretty. metal. Yeah, so pretty. And then what's the backing? Is it the same backing, the leather backing? Yeah, it's, this, it's, a, it's a plastic, Oh, backing cool. that goes oh. on. Oh, cool. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, so those are called the floral. They're a, they're a little heavy, but depending on where you wear them on your knitwear, they won't they won't fall. If you you know if you're wearing them up here, they'll be well supported by the body, so they would they'll rest flat. Sometimes if you wear something low on the front, it can it fall happens. forward. Yeah. Yeah. But if it's higher up, it will not, it won't do that. And actually we haven't been carrying the pedestal buttons, but now I'm going to be placing an order for a bunch of them because we're gonna be 
putting pedestal buttons everywhere. <laughs> yes, pedestal. Oh, they're so amazing. You can, they're, they are, they're sculpting tools. They're mm -hmm. amazing. I love them. Are you gonna and I, I have them in um, three sizes. They're in the seven eighths size, the one and a half and the two inch. Mm -hmm. I love the small ones. Um, but you know, let's imagine I didn't put this here. Let's imagine that then I wanted one medium one or I love mixing the different sizes and even mixing like the different leathers. If you have like a really simple, like the shawl that I just finished, it's this great olive green color. And I mm -hmm. think it's just going to look great like that with like, you know, like maybe three or four of the leather buttons and like, you know, the black yeah. and the it's espresso and just mix it up with like the different colors. Mm -hmm. It's always so yeah. fun too, as long as you don't have, you know, too much going on crazy in the knitwear, which that's why I love that shawl. I just finished. It's great for that. And that was something, yeah. Laura, I think I saw done when I was at a, um, a show. And, you know, I know that DFW was canceled and that kind of thing. And Carla, I know you've done the DFW show before, mm -hmm. but I've seen like that uh, at the shows. And that's great because you get so much, you know, if we go to the, any of these fiber events, we're so inspired. And that's where mm -hmm. I think I first started seeing a lot of your stuff years ago. And, oh, yeah. and started buying. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the other thing I'd like to always remind people is, and my girlfriends always forget this, is that, you know, this is this is jewelry for your knitwear. So I always encourage people to keep these, you know, store them with your jewelry. And just like eventually when we all leave the house on a regular basis, right. you know, we'll stop and we'll think and we'll put on earrings before we go and that kind of thing. And that's where I think if you keep them there, you tend to use them more. And as you use them more, you'll love them more. And then there'll be other ones that you want. And it's just a great way to dress up your knitwear. But too often, my friends end up storing them with their knitting and then they don't wear them. And I'm like, they're jewelry. Oh, right. They're just jewelry for your right. knitwear. Yeah, yeah. Because you don't go to your jewel, you don't go to your knitting um, basket. I never to go to my yarn dress. closet before I leave. Yeah. <laughs> well, unless I'm looking for a project, but I don't go to my yarn closet before I leave the house, but I will you know, I will check to make sure I've got earrings on or something like that. So often if we yeah. store them with our jewelry, we tend to use them a lot more. And that I just inspires these, us. I think of these as um, like, they're, like a, there's like a style toolkit. Having ped some pedestal buttons, you know, shawl cuff and shawl pin, several different, I would say several different pins um, gives you a, a style toolkit to work with. And I, to me, um, I, I make a lot of different styles of shawl pins. And part of that is not, it's not just to, oh, a new design so that you can buy more. It's because we have different jewelry for different outfits, for different moods, for different looks. And shawl pins are like that. They're like jewelry. It's not just, oh, I need something to secure my shawl. It's like, oh, I need the, the right visual statement to secure that shawl is how I think about it. So I took that pin out here and so I need to put something back. So you saw I had that triangle, which gives that a minimalist look. But if I put this pin, which is called Moroccan windows, and it's got a lot of open work uh, I want to just point out, I like to push the knitwear up with my thumb so that the stick is going through straight. And I like to feel the tip first with my finger so I make sure that I'm not splitting fiber. That's my preferred way to put the pin on. So this shape, this irregular shape, has a very different vibe than that very crisp minimalist triangle or the runa that I had on earlier. It's a, you know, it's a totally different kind of visual statement. And that's, to me, that's, that's exciting. Being able to switch the shawl jewelry so that I get a completely different kind of visual effect. The way you would if you put on different earrings with the same 
outfit or put on a different um, necklace. Um, I haven't talked about cuffs, shawl cuffs. No, and Laura, you haven't talked about the charms that you've been designing too, which I know Carla's wearing that great tree frag, which is so cute. Um, yeah, this is. Um, yeah. So there's some really fun charms. I haven't gotten my tree frog yet, but I need to get one of those kind of things. I know, so I there's some great ones practice. coming out. So so. More dragonflies. Yeah, we've got the... My favorite. I love my dragonfly, yeah. And one of the things I... These are great, and I love how it sits in the fabric, you know, and that's part of Laura's thought process with making sure it's not top heavy, it doesn't fall off, it actually nuzzles down in the fabric. But... Yeah. because of yeah because of that curving they stay in place like mm -hmm. how many of us have worn stuff where you know we're bending over picking up of course those yarn balls that have fallen the on the floor and the whole thing just falls out and so these are you know i love laura your thought process that goes into a piece it's not just to stick with a cute little ornament on the end you know uh, i'll just give you a little backstory so the honeybee was the first of our um our filigree critters we brought out the honeybee first. And you can see that the, the honeybee extends from the stick, ex extends off the top. We did the honeybee and then we did the monarch. The honeybee took us forever. I don't even know how long. We started out with a realistic honeybee sketch. And we wanted the honeybee to like be perched on top of, the, of a ball. And um, my wax worker was like, no. I'm not doing that. So we were like, okay, back to the drawing board, literally. And then we thought, okay, we'll do this realistic honeybee kind of doing something less difficult. Wax worker again was like, nope, not even gonna try. The, the shape, you know, the legs, the, all of it was too complex for, his, he felt that his carving ability, it was just gonna take too long, we might, we might say no to it too many times. And so we, we, were, we had the, several discussions like, okay, we know that when something gets too hard, like it might fail as a design, we should probably not pursue this. I really wanted to do a honeybee. I would, pollinators, they're so important. I really wanted to do a honeybee. So at one point I was like, well, a goose, you can do filigree in your sleep. Just do a filigree honeybee. Come on, just do it. And so he, and he was like, oh, great. He had it within like two days. He had the sketch and I was like, take it to the wax worker, send it to the wax worker. Like we were gold by then. And so after that, I was like, okay, all the critters, they're filigree because filigree is your sweet spot. You know, let's just run with your strengths. Let's just do it. So honeybee came first, then the the monarch, and then we came to the dragonfly. The dragonfly confounded us in other, for other reasons. <clears throat> we started, of course, with the tail of the dragonfly up here so that the dragonfly kind of extended off the stick. And I got the sample, it looked great. Got the samples, I put it on, and the whole bottom of the dragonfly disappeared into the knitwear. I was like, oh, okay, that's not really the idea. <laughs> tried to pull it up, you know, pull it out of the knitwear so that you would see that it was a whole dragonfly and not just like the whole the body got cut off. And then it wanted to fall forward because it was so much, uh, such a big piece. It was uh, up so high. So I said, well, let's, let's have the stick come from here. But then it, it did something weird on the body and didn't work. So we tried it again. Okay, let's have it come from the top. So we tried that. But the way that he had made the stick curve was more like, more like our previous pin. So imagine, see where this is curving? Imagine if this stick were curving like that stick. It didn't work to create this space. So it's, there was still something wrong with it. So we did another set of samples. It took so long. It took maybe four iterations before we finally got it right, before all the curves in the stick, the location at the head, you know, this relationship to the ornament, 
it took us many, many iterations before it rested on the body properly, felt comfortable, didn't fall forward. The, the um, abdomen of the, of the piece didn't disappear into the network. It was, it was, <clears throat> it was complicated, but once we, once we worked out that part of the design, then we could replicate it for the hummingbird. And then we could do it again for the sea turtle. And then we could do it again for our little tree frog. So we have this whole menagerie and they all function in the same way. And even though they're quite big, they've got that open work, so they're light. And they rest down over the netware, so they're supporting themselves against the netware, so they're not falling forward, they're not top heavy. And so when we were working on these, we I wanted to develop um, a unique to jewel approach to the shawl cuff. Because I had taken <clears throat> these spring gates that we use in our closures and I brought them to the cuff. So the way they work is that there's a little hinge here and this is a gate and you push it down and you release one side. So then that is a strap that you can wrap multiple times around the knitwear. So it gets wrapped next to or through the ring. And then you can slip it back on. So that's how those cuffs work. But this is not an original to jewel design, this ring. It's a, it's a one that I get from another producer. So I wanted to create something that would be just a, you know, a, a distinct jewel design that could, well, basically, so nobody could rip it off. <laughs> that is, that's a thing. So- I think we need a fairy. <laughs> you need a fairy? So, oh, you need a fairy charm. Yes. <laughs> I thought you meant a fairy to protect my proprietary design. <laughs> oh, we need both. We need both. Oh, exactly. <laughs> uh, so I created this series of findings that are almost like jewelry findings that would allow us to add a strap and then you can slip the charm off and put a different charm on. So we call them charm locks. And then you can put the strap back on. So you're locking the charm on there. That's the concept. And it works as a cuff, but it will also work as jewelry. So it works as a cuff on the knitwear. The strap gets wrapped around from the top and underneath, because if we did it the other way, then you'd see the suede, which I don't want you to see. So it's like that. But I can also wear it on my wrist. And we do custom sizes. So if you want something that will fit your body and you talk to Carla about it, then you can get a custom size. Doesn't that look so pretty? The little and you can also there. get it long enough to wear around your neck too. Emily was wearing it as a necklace. Yes, because the oxbow, the other component, we have it on, you know, like I always wear the simple snap so I could I could put it on there I don't have one of the oxbows right here um so yeah that's the that's the charm lock um in the in the cuffs and then what Christina I'm still getting around to your query Christina <laughs> what Christina was talking about is the charm lock shawl pin so you can see here, we created a curved component so that the stick can go through. And we, and we 
put wiggles in our sticks because we always put wiggles in our sticks so that we'll hold on to the knitwear. And so this one you twist as you put it in so that your, your, your knitwear is right in here. And so it ends up- That's great. Like, it's not going anywhere locked in there like that. Yeah, it doesn't go anywhere. And it's locking that charm in there too. And, and we do have the, the charm separately so that you can get, you know, the cuff and the pin and everything and then just get an additional. Get them all. All yeah. the charm. Like Pandora for your shawl wear. You can just swap out all those little beads or wear a whole bunch of them. It's your call. <laughs> exactly. And yeah, I mean, it, you know, they're so pretty. You could put a one on a ribbon and I happen to have a ribbon right here. Could put one on a ribbon <laughs> and wear it. Not for this purpose. I was just, I was going to. I was gonna lace on this this clasp because it's got holes big enough for my tapestry needle. But since it's to hand, you know, you might as well put it on and then it can become a pendant or yarn, you know, um, all those fine, beautiful, delicate I, I, yarns you can do like, a, pretty eye cord or something and make a piece of jewelry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'll give you a little secret. We are working on a couple of new charms. This is very exciting. I'm going to just run, get them. I'll just, I'll just show you. Ooh, I'm excited. I wonder if there's a fairy in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thinking probably not because she tends to do a lot of um, a lot of animals and you know her critters kind of thing. But so I think maybe not. But, but the like there may be are, a fairy in the future. Yeah, and the fairies protect all those animals. This is true. They do. Okay, so um, oh, Kathy, I'll answer that question in a little bit. I, I didn't want to interrupt you. So we've been working with a, a woodworking studio, as you saw from these combinations of silver and wood for years. And <clears throat> I, in the past, I've loved using semi-precious stones in some of our knitwear jewelry, but they have to be set in silver bezels and that it's a little pricey these days with the cost of silver. There are a bunch of reasons that we aren't, haven't been doing that um, recently. And sometimes when we, when we want to get a particular stone, there's only a limited supply and then we can't get it again. So um, I suggested to my collaborator, Goose, they said, well, how about if we get stones made out of wood? So we got these two rosewood stones from this mm -hmm. kind of pillow. It's a little bit faceted. And then this is just a cabochon. We, get, we got those made. And these are coming soon. They're actually in production. The wire is a little different shape. Look at that. Isn't that gorgeous? So this is a totally different, oops, it's backwards. It's a totally different um, look from the critters. It's simple, elegant. So if you don't want a filigree animal and you want something that will just have, um, have a, just some quieter look, this is coming soon. So we'll have the square setting and then the round setting. Oh, 
It's a very different feeling, very mm -hmm. different, quieter mm -hmm. feeling with this with this charm. So that's coming soon. That's just a just a I little secret that. I'm sharing with you a little. <laughs> Well, there's a history behind rosewood of it, you know, it symbolizes kindness and good heart. And so there's a lot of warmth, I think, that you can kind of get from the wood. And I feel that I'm sure the people that actually carve it and inlay it, again, so many hands touch these pieces. I feel like it would kind of bridge that connection. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, and for the, the rosewood that we use is farmed just in case you're worried about sustainability. It's Great. Mm -hmm. I know I was wondering about that. That's fantastic, Laura. Yeah, Again, working not, with the communities to help them support themselves. It's not rainforest wood. And um, there are <clears throat> there are other woods that I want to, we have used them in the past and I want to bring them back. And um, like mango wood, sapodilla wood, jackfruit wood. When you see a fruit wood, you know that it's a household tree. So it's never a rainforest deforestation tree. It's a, our tree in our yard stopped bearing. So we cut it down and sold the wood and planted a new tree. That's how fruit trees work. And it's really interesting when you're, when you're riding or traveling through the countryside in Bali, You'll see a lot of what we would think are woods. Oh, that's forest. It's garden. There are palms, bananas. Uh, there's a, so there's coconut palm. There's something called salak, which is a, it's a very spiky kind of, almost looks like a date palm, I think, where the, the palm fronds are very tall, but they come out close to the base of, you know, close to the ground. And they have these big bunches of a brown kind of, um, scaly looking fruit. There's that. Um, then there's the jackfruit and the mango and the um, breadfruit and all, all these different trees and trees that are used for wood. They're all gardened. Almost all of the what we would look at going through the landscape and say, oh, that's forest. It's actually garden. And all of those trees are tended and owned and it's, it's interesting. It's only when you get way, way up in the mountains where the, the land is so difficult to, to access, it's only then that you are actually in forest rather than in garden. It's, it's a different way of seeing the land. It, it took me a while, to, it took my eyes a while to interpret the, the botanical landscape there before I could begin to recognize that it was not forest, it was garden. This, um, this workshop, the man who owns it has, has um, kidney disease. So he has to go to several hours to the main city from like the central south kind of up in the hills, down to the coast, to the city, the main city, um, to travel once a week to get dialysis. And he actually, um, somebody in his workshop. I don't think I don't think it was him, but I think it was like his his right hand guy uh, actually got COVID, but is is fine. He didn't succumb to that. He was just sick for a while, and the workshop was shut down. So we have had a slowdown in our production because of the illness in, the, in that workshop. But for the most part, our, my collaborators and our artisans have been okay. People haven't gotten sick. That's good. So it's three, do, 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 are there special requests of like styling advice that I can give you? Or uh, Kathy, actually Kathy had asked about how, um, cause I'm offering a discount today, 15% um, mm -hmm. off. 
and she asked how we could how they can purchase with the discount. Everything that we normally carry is up on our website with the discount. But like I said, we haven't had the pedestal buttons. There's a couple of things that aren't there. So if anybody wants pet the pedestal buttons or anything like that, you could just um, uh, give us a call or give me or send us a, an email or a message and we'll get in touch with you and we'll because we will be ordering it. Okay. And I've got everything in stock for a while. My um, this is kind of interesting. My leather people have had an absolute explosion of business because they do a lot for um, pet products, leather, um, pet stuff, and all those COVID puppies <laughs> need yeah. leashes and collars, <laughs> so they're totally overwhelmed, and um, that has sent my my lead time on leather stuff from the stuff that needs to be clicked in particular like these straps I can get them quickly because I just asked them to cut it but this stuff where they need their whole manufacturing mm -hmm. system sort of manufacturing line these now, now instead of three weeks if they take 12 weeks oh wow but I just got my pedestal button in order yay Oh, so good. I'm fully Well then, Christina, you can expect an order by Monday. <laughs> Great. So yeah, sounds so wonderful. Can, and yeah, yeah, if anybody has any other questions, I did put in the chat, you know, the different color options of the buttons, and they do come in oh, three good. different sizes. And then the metal, there is a, the filigree metal ones come in. Laura, you still have those available in two sizes, correct? Yeah, they're in the small and the medium size. Okay. The metal and then, pedal stall, um, okay. Yeah, eventually we're gonna have more styles in the, in the met metal, but we have, I'm creating a new mechanism that does not rely on the screw. And that's going to take just a little time to work out exactly. I mean, as you can see with the, my story about the, the dragonfly, I, I want to work on something until it really works, until the function is not going to fail once you get it home. So this new um, kind of in between the stitches concept that I'm working out, it's, we're still developing it, but that will allow us to bring to you a much broader range of shapes in the metal and, and very light. And this metal is pretty heavy, <clears throat> but you see we're doing all these things with filigree and open work. And so I'll be able to make even fairly large metal pieces that will have that lightness that you are, that you're wanting to have because it's on your knitwear, but also be really secure. So any of you who are in the room, if you, if you have a shawl right now to hand next to you that you love it because it's beautiful, but every time you put it on, you're like, ah, why does this resist me and make it make life so hard? <laughs> if you have that shawl there right now and you want my help, I will help you. I would love to help. Charlotte, you. is that? <laughs> this is one of them. I mean, I love this shawl, but when I wear it, I just feel like it hangs. I don't know what to do with it. So how is it your wingspan? It's, I just measured it, it's um, 40, no, it's 72 inches long, and the point goes down to 23. And 72 I, I inches, touch. that's long, this is 72 inches. Yeah, this is 17, yeah. So um, 72 inches, but it's short this way, it's only 23 inches this way. Yeah, so, shallow triangles and shallow crescents are hard. Yeah. Here's so here's what this this almost always works. So if you're draping it symmetrically, do you have a way that you could just hold it together like right here? With do you have something there like a safety pin, something that you can or well, a shopping, something that you can use to secure it? Yeah, I mean what one of the things that I got at the fiber festival was a, a magnetic closure, but it's very heavy. Mm -hmm. Um so if I close it. Here, right, just here. Higher? Little high, yeah, right there. Try that. Yeah. 
And then it, it's a little drapey here, but I guess that's okay. Rotate a quarter turn so that you put that closure on your shoulder. And then the two sides will be hanging over. Either side? Yeah. And then just, you know, let, let it, right. And maybe so, um, So if I were going to do that with this piece. So you want it, you want it secured when you're putting it on, you want it secured up high enough that when you rotate it, but it's high on the shoulder. It's going to be, it's not going to be falling off your shoulder. And so I can see that you have a little bit of volume here. Right. You can fold that down. Well, and it's an inside it out. Creating a little bit of a shawl but collar, a little bit of a drape there. Yeah. But it's an inside out sort of a thing, right? Oh, it doesn't have a right. It's got a wrong side, right? Yeah. Yeah. So maybe fold, tuck it in or something. You could tuck it in. Yeah. So how does, I mean, I think that the, the closure could move up higher, higher yeah because it almost looks like it's a little too far down um on the other side on your shoulder which could inhibit your range of motion here yeah and which which pin or which style of closure would you recommend that you make that would be good for that pedestal button the pedestal button okay I mean, I've done it with a with a um, penannular brooch, which if you were going to use a pin, I would say use a penannular brooch because it's so secure. Like this one is small, the Clio. The penannular brooch is a one piece brooch. So this is attached. Mm -hmm. It's not going to come apart. And so <clears throat> if you wanted to use a pin instead of a pedestal button, I would pr I would use a penannular brooch, and this one would be a good one because it's small. So the stick always goes in horizontally. The ring comes down, turns down, and it turns down because that will keep it in the gravity will keep it in place. And so that looks pretty. You can wear it just on. Yeah, on the front side of the shoulder. Uh -huh. And then you should have good range of motion. Uh -huh. And you can see all that knitting. Does it feel comfortable? Um, it does. I can't tell how it looks. I mean, yeah. It looks good. It looks good. Yeah. Stitches are beautiful. It shows the stitches very well. Yeah. All your mosaic yeah, work. It really shows it's got, and it's got, it's got bead work in it. I mean, I just love this thing. Oh, wow. Yeah. But I just haven't. I haven't figured out. So this looks, this feels yeah. right. Yeah, this feels good. Yeah. And that's one of those pieces, again, we don't want them bunched up around our neck. You've right. got that beautiful mosaic work. I think that Laura's dead on with the brooch style of it. And then it just, it will hang in the front there and really show it off well. Right. Right. Because we, the way you had it, you had it over your shoulders, but it was kind of falling like right. this, right. which means you can't see it at all from right. the front. Right. right. So right. it's not, it's not contributing to your visual appearance right? when somebody's looking at you from the front. Right, and plus you want to be hands-free. You don't want to constantly be, you know. Right, adjusting, yeah. Right, right. You know, I, I there's a, you see this often on, on knitwear patterns where the model will be holding, like it's a cardigan, the model's holding it like this, that means it pulls to the side, it needs a closure, but doesn't have one. <laughs> That's what that means. <laughs> or the, the shawl held together like this, or, you know, anytime the model is holding the piece, or if it's a, if it's a cart, like say it's a, a sweater, a pullover, and the model's like this, with the arms way back, that means that it's really way too much volume right here. Yeah. That's what that means. <laughs> or, 
or like this, pulling it to the sides with the with the hands and the hips. That also means there's something really slumpy about that shaping. <laughs> it's not working, and they're covering it up with the way that the model's being photographed. Yeah, well, thank but you. this looks really pretty. Yeah, thank you. I mean, and, and I really do like that it shows off the. There's a lot of work. Yeah, so, yeah it's great. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other anyone desperate else needs for help? Any rescue missions I can help with? <laughs> <laughs> I had a woman come up to me at a fiber festival once. I think it was Stitches West. And she had a big rectangle. It was a big piece, gray, maybe worsted. And <clears throat> she came up and she put her bags down. This was first thing in the morning. She was like, save me. I'm OCD and my shawl is driving me crazy. I'm going nuts, literally, I'm going nuts, help. I was like, it's okay, I'll, I'll save you. So we took her, her big rectangle and we positioned it asymmetrically. So, you know, one side higher than the other. And we did just what, what we did for you, Charlotte. I think we did, um, three pedestal buttons here and then rotated it a quarter turn so that the whole rectangle was secured on her body it wasn't moving around she had her arms free and it was absolutely staying in place and she came back to me i think two more times during the show and she was like thank you so much you totally saved me i was i was really going nuts because the, the knitwear was so, it was taking up so much of her brain space and so physically irritating because of the way that it was impinging on her thoughts and her focus that she- I'm glad you know. said that because I have a large rectangle shawl and all I know to do with it is just wrap it around each arm and you just walk around, you know, carrying it. So, so what size pedestal button do you suggest, the small or the medium? I like the filigree. You, you're- um, the filigree, these ones would, well, that's kind of a geometric pattern there. Yeah. So you think and this is a go. floral pattern. It's a blue, it's blue and white. Yes. Uh -huh. I think for you, I would go with the smalls because there's so much interesting that's going on in that pattern. I would not want to detract or distract from it at all. So I think a small black pedestal button or a small um, truffle <clears throat> would be terrific on that piece because it will, you, it looks like you have like little squares. Yeah, yeah, can you see it? Yeah, mm -hmm. I can. So I think this shape will kind of um, speak to those little mm -hmm. square, you know, pops of blue without fighting or distracting. Yeah, okay, good, good, good. And you can I, I even- actually, I actually have a pedestal button and I just didn't bring it up with me, um, but it's a larger one and it's brown. Mm -hmm. But I go play with that. I yeah, guess play I, with that. I was concerned because it's it's a, um, a stocking that, or a, a um, fingering weight that the pedestal button might be too wide to push through the, the knit. This is a fingering and I knit it on two and a half. Okay. So, and you just put it, push it through the knit, through the stitch. And just make sure that the stitches come out on either side. Now I've had people ask me, well, does it make a hole? Yes, it makes a hole because that's how it functions. But the hole, it, it, and when you first take it out, if you've had it in place for a long time, you will, it will, the memory of that hole will be there. But as soon as you zhuzh and spritz and block, it's gone. Yeah. It's okay. just, it disappears. It disappears. Charlotte, the other thing, if you decide to go with a pedestal, you can also do multiples of them too. So if you feel yeah. like right now, like that one side of your arm is a little chilly, yeah, you could do like a couple of them. And then that would also kind of you can still yeah. see it beautifully but it would um, kind of cover up it would just like our break. arm if our arms get cold or yeah. you know you know I yeah think you could too, do a couple of them in there you've yeah. got those blue stripes 
if you wanted the, this to really d be diminutive and kind of blend in so that it did not become um, a striking visual element, you could locate the pedestal buttons where those stripes meet. Yes, here, yeah. So they would just be on the dark part and they would almost disappear. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Yeah, good, thank you. That's, I like that. I like, I think I like the two pedestal buttons. It looks here. really good. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. it's beautiful. Really good. And I think once you locate, like, where exactly should they be? How many should I have? Do I want one, two, three? Do I want just two or two? Um, once you figure that out, do, do you want the split to be right here? Do you want it to be right on top of the shoulder? All of those choices are subtle, but they do change the way it looks on the body. And one of those combinations will look better on you and we'll feel better so look for that bliss point yep you'll yep. find it no that's good i thank you very much no oh, you're welcome thank yes thank you this has been wonderful um this is this has just been great i'm so excited now i want to go and play with <laughs> pedestal buttons i know i know there's so much fun yeah i do too as soon as we hang up i'm gonna go down to the mirror and play <laughs> yeah. yeah they're great they're really great they're my absolute favorite thing I've ever made I mean it's been years now since I made them and and um I never get tired of playing with them the possibilities are yes I hadn't realized all the possibilities until until now and my friend actually gave me the the jewel pedestal button probably a few years ago and I just I thought it was just a closure right as opposed to a decorative piece so yeah. this has been really helpful. It's, it can do it all. Yeah. So yes. like even if I want to keep, this is one of those arrangements that you see on patterns and it looks great. But if I, you know, if I go down and up and, and it falls apart, but of course the designer doesn't do anything to keep it in place. But with the pedestal buttons, even if I just want that to come right there, I can put a pedestal button here. I could put another one there if I wanted to, but I don't think I would need to. So I could put a pedestal button there. I could put a pedestal button here, pedestal button there, or I could do, you know, like one, two, three, four. And that would, that would give me like a really striking um, visual statement to, cause this is a very simple shawl visually. But imagine if I had, I want to go below the bus point though. <laughs> I don't want my <laughs> maybe someday I would, but not not today. <laughs> you know, so imagine I have I have the probably I'm still I'm not gonna go there. I'm gonna do, do that. So maybe I would do three. And then that's really cool, right? Or I would do two close together and one farther apart because I want to I want to make sure that this stays over here because otherwise it's going to migrate. That mm -hmm. knitwear misbehavior again. So they can start to become this kind of visual contrast to what else is going on. Or Christina, you talked about wanting to use, you know, multiple shapes or multiple sizes on a piece. So, you know, something like that, where you've got the medium and the small. Yeah, I love mixing up the sizes, but then again, like the shawl in the background of you, the circular, the modular circular, I like mixing those up too, where I might do a circular and a triangle on the same garment and like yeah. use the circular like shawl stick on the triangle one and the triangle shawl stick on the circular one. So I kind of, or even I've layered those because they're so light, I can do like round over square and because they come yeah, in a square triangle here, and round. You know, but, I've got this yeah, other sometimes, side to control. So maybe, yeah. I would. Yeah. Sometimes they're I kind really, of fun just to. I like wearing more. If I'm going to wear pins, yeah. I tend to go to the minimalist shapes like these. Um, and then, you know, you might as well make a make a statement yeah. mm -hmm. probably I would put this going the other way 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's like shapes. So great. In, in case you didn't get it, shapes. <laughs> <laughs> well, and even some of the latches and stuff, you know, when I'm doing the latches, I'll make a point of doing a couple, which uh, Laura, I've seen some of your pictures on, on your website and stuff where you're, you know, you've got, you do a couple of latches or you, you know, yeah, it's just so more like of that, where's not... your eye being drawn? Mm -hmm. right, really so, helps. So this piece, if I'm not going to do pedestal buttons because I want to get in and out of it, but I want to do two latches. One of the things that I like to do is have one going from the top layer to the bottom layer. And then because I want to control the underside too, I take my other latch, start it on the bottom layer. You know, so just, just I'm simulating here and bring it to the top. So I've got symmetry with the latches, but I'm controlling both the top and the bottom with the latch ending up on the top. And then you can, un, you know, you can unsnap eat both of them. So rather than taking it off over your head, you're just unsnapping, unsnapping, and then you can get out of the piece. Or think about this. You've got that boxy jacket out of really fancy yarn that you knit five years ago or more. And, and it's, a dome and sleeve and so it's got a lot of fabric here and you that's not trending anymore and so you want to manage all this fabric latches are your friend because you can attach one side to the front and another to the back and bring in that do bottom. a little ruching yeah mm -hmm. yeah a little shaping on the side or <clears throat> Here's, you know, pedestal buttons. We have all those drapey pieces that are open in front. They have no closures, which, you know, looks great on the pattern, but maybe it's not perfect for you. Maybe you want something that's got some more shape through here. So you could cross it over with the pedestal buttons and have one on one side, one on the other side, or... You can put one on the inside and create a loop with a piece of ribbon on the inside and then have a latch or say a lock on the outside. Mm -hmm. They're just, again, if you play with the possibilities, think first, okay, if in my, in the best of all possible worlds, how would this actually lie on the body and fit me? what would look absolutely the best and feel the best and work the best for my life? Figure out what, what is that? Okay, now which of Laura's closures will get me there? And then that, that's one approach. Figuring it out. Wonderful. Great. Right. Well, thank you so much. This has been great. My pleasure. My pleasure. So, um, so I guess we'll, and thank you for staying over because this is we've run over, but this has been this has been wonderful. So if anybody ha if anybody needs anything, you can call you can call us um, or, or call email message. You know how to get a hold of us. And um, so I guess we'll stop we'll by the shop. Don't forget it's LYS day, so stop by the shop. Yeah. Say hello to Carla. She can also help you find something if you want to place you know, in order for something, the buttons that she doesn't have in stock, I'm sure she'd be happy to do that, but it's LYS day. Get out and support right. your local yarn shop. Yeah. Um, yes. if, it, if at all possible, you know, and just, yeah. Yes. It's we're a, here till, we're here till five and we've got lots and lots of, of things to play for you to, lots and lots of jewel for you to play with too. <laughs> lots Good. of that. Great. Great. Yeah. And we'll be getting in the pedestal buttons. So so, so thank you thank you, thank you so for much. inviting me thank this you been, yeah and thanks christina so you are bye. most welcome it's been a pleasure it's great to thank see you. everyone okay thank you bye-bye bye. bye bye thank you my pleasure